In this next video on data visualization, we're going to be talking about the common data types as well as why it's important that you pay attention to what type of data you've actually got. In the last video, we talked all about high dimensional data and I gave the example of different people and different ways in which we can measure and record different aspects of the individual as an example of high dimensional data. And in that video, I previewed the fact that different types and dimensions of data actually have different data types. So here we're going to talk a little bit more about what that's about and why it's important that we pay attention to the different data types. So in my opinion, there are three fundamental data types, and I'm going to call them continuously valued, ordinal, and categorical. These are just different types of data, so it's really important that we pay attention to what they are because trying to compare them and mix them is kind of like comparing apples to oranges. Continuously valued data is kind of the most straightforward type of data set. It's just a number of some kind. These numbers could be positive or negative. It could be whole numbers. It could be fractions. It could be decimals of some kind. Okay, So these are just regular data that has a number attached to it. These are things that we can measure, like how tall you are, uh, how, how, many, how many centimeters your um, fingers are, stuff like that. These are all continuously valued data sets. The second data set, the data type, is ordinal. Now, ordinal, on the face of it, sounds a lot like continuously value, but there's an important difference. Ordinal numbers are ordered non-negative integers, and they indicate orderings, like you coming first place, second place, third place, and so on and so forth. You cannot come in one and a half place, and you can't come in negative 2.75 place. So they have to be non-negative integers, they're not negative numbers, and they're whole numbers indicating ordering, especially that's important for a reason I'm going to tell you about in the next second. The third type of data set is categorical. And categorical is kind of like, you know, kind of intuitive what it is, but it's important to keep them separate from the first two types of data. Categorical data are data sets that are come in distinct classes. So for example, if you're an animal, you could be a raccoon, you could be a trout, or you could be a blue jay. Those are just different types of animals. Now, the reason this is important is because a raccoon is not like a trout, and a trout is not like a blue jay, and they're just distinct different from each other, and it's not obvious if one of them are close to each other or not. The reason we care about these three fundamental data types is because if you keep track of what type of data set you have, it gives you a notion of how different one data point is different from another. This notion of closeness um, and uh, distance measures, how close together one thing is from another thing, is a really foundational concept because it underlines everything that we have to do in modeling machine learning as well as visualization. How do we measure if something is close to something else means that we can make quantitative relationships and quantitative relationships including building models, regression models, classification models, as well as using those distances to actually place things on a piece of paper or on a computer screen and visualizing them. So I'm going to give you an example of why this actually matters, what type of data set that you have and what data types you're using to compute these distance measures. Probably the most intuitive type of distance measures are the first two categorical kinds. We have the, the, we have the, the continuously valued numbers and we have the ordinal numbers. So I'm going to use for an example here the men's wheelchair divisions for the Boston Marathon in 2022. So here are the first four place finishers for, for this race, uh, numbers one, two, three, and four, and their respective finishing times in the Boston Marathon. You can see here that these are the same results. Okay, so we're talking about the same things here. These four individuals finished with those times and they came in first place, second place, third place, and fourth place respectively. But if you pay a little bit more attention, you'll see that the first place finisher finished significantly faster than places two, three, and four, right? So those two and three came in within seconds of each other, and, and uh, they were preceded by the first place finisher by minutes, and then, you know, like a minute later, uh, place number four came in and crossed the finish line. And so if we were to be using the times as, uh, as, a, cate as, a, as a numerical variable, we would say that, that um, uh, the place, the person number one is far away from persons two and three who were kind of came in closer together because their times are closer together. But if we were to use the ordinal variable instead and look at their ranks in terms of where they came in, then you would say the one is just as far away from two and two as two is from three. 
So it kind of matters here, and there's no right answer, right? This is the same results, and we could be running our models and using our visualization techniques using either of these columns and dimensions of data. But it matters which one you pick because the closeness of these competitors depends on which type of data we had chosen to use. And like I said, there's no right answer, but it's important to pay attention because this notion of closeness and how they're defined for continuously valued and ordinal variables is the underlying assumption that's made by all of the visualization techniques and most of the machine learning and data science models that we'll be talking about in, um, in, in the rest of, uh, of, of our analyses. So even though if you're not using data of one of these different kinds, um, it is very, very common that most data sets are then massaged and put into one of these data types because these are the data types that we have the ability to, um, to compute these distances and to compute these metrics so we can figure out what to do with them later on. For example, if you have an image, super duper common type of data set, right? An image can be very easily turned into a set of numbers because you take uh, one common way to do it would be to take every pixel, take the numerical value of the intensity, let's say in RGB, red, green, and blue channels in each of those pixels and turn that into a set of numbers. Similarly, if you have an audio series or another time series of some kind, you can turn those into numbers by looking at every sampling point in time, measuring the recording, whatever the amplitude of that signal is in positive and negative numbers and turning that into a series of numbers. Now in high dimensional data speak, sometimes we consider each time point to be a dimension. It's one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it, but it's one way of turning time series data into high dimensional data. Okay. We talked a little bit in the last video about text and languages, and I talked to you about one way of turning this, this kind of mysterious type of data into a set of numbers. Um, so there's a lot of different other ways of doing it, but nevertheless, the most common way of dealing with text and language data is to turn them into numbers of some kind. So it's really important to, to think about uh, these types of, um, of data. And if your data is not one of these types, one of the most common things to do, my strong recommendation is think about what is the closest type to what you have, and if you can turn anything you have, uh, let's say you have a spectroscopy image, you have a brain imaging study of some kind, if you can turn that into something that resembles an image or audio or some kind of text, then you have the ability to leverage the lots and lots of tools in learning and visualization. We can then immediately use them off the shelf. And so this is a really important thing to remember how are the what are the fundamental data types and how can you turn whatever you have into one of these data types so that we can use all the tools that other people have developed to do all the visualization and modeling as well. I'm going to tell you a couple of different types of data as well that don't fit neatly into what I've talked about so far, but nevertheless, we can turn them into different numbers. So the first one that's kind of uh, interesting as well as kind of useful in different contexts is networks as data. So what does a network mean? So a network has uh, nodes and relationships. So I'm going to illustrate that with a really simple example here. So what we're looking at here is a network that's visualized as uh, individuals. These are these are kids in first grade, in one first grade class. And what they've done here is they ask every kid, if you could pick two other people to sit next to, who would they be? And so they all took this little survey and, uh, and the results are visualized following here, where um, each circle is an individual, the girls are colored as blue, and the, the black circles are boys. And the diameter of the circle is proportional to how many people picked that person, how many people wanted to sit next to them. And so you can see here, SL is super popular. Everyone wants to sit next to SL in first grade. Okay, So the social dynamics here are rather obvious, <laughs> just looking at this network visualization. Um, so you have one popular person, everyone wants to sit next to her. And then um, there's a kind of boys want to sit next to each other, and the girls want to sit next to each other. Very typical social dynamics in, in first grade. By third grade, this has changed somewhat. There's no longer one very popular person. Um, people have formed friendships groups, but there is still this rather stark segregation in between the boys and the girls where um, they sort of want to sit next to, um, next to their friends of that kind. By grade eight, this has changed dramatically. <laughs> um, so by looking at networks as data and then looking at network visualization this kind, um, there's a lot of really interesting social dynamics that can be revealed in this way. 
I just want to be really explicit here in how do you turn network data into numerical data, like we talked about in the three fundamental data types. Um, so we're going to look one more time at this uh, first grade network. Okay, I'm going to show you a subset of the network and just be really explicit about how do you turn this type of data into a set of numbers. I'm not showing you the entire data set here because there's a little too many, so I'm just going to show you four individuals. Okay, so we're going to say here what's happening is that we're going to have a matrix of numbers where every time one person says they want to sit with another person, so this is a from column, this is a two column. I'm going to put a one there, and if they didn't say they want to sit next to the other person, I'm going to find a zero. So the way to interpret this is that if, if JN wanted to sit next to SL, that means that this element becomes a one. But JN did not say they want to sit next to CR, so that's a zero. And JN also didn't say they wanted to sit next to MK, so that's a zero there as well. Okay, so if you fill in the survey results and put them into a matrix of this kind, we've then turned a network data set into a numerical data set. Um, and that this is also a, what's called a directed the graph, a directed network, because it's not necessarily reciprocal, right? So CR wanted to sit next to SL, but SL did not want to sit next to CR. And so um, it could be a one directional relationship. So this matrix is not necessarily symmetric in that way. There's lots and lots of tools for visualizing networks, and also analyzing networks of this kind. So they're really interesting. I'm going to show you one more particularly uh, memorable example I have seen in terms of visualizing networks as data. And this is one that, that was made to visualize um, the Congress people and, uh, and how they have voted over the years. So here we're looking at one example from the year 1951. Each dot is a congressperson. They are colored by whether or not they're identified as a, as a Democratic member of Congress or a Republican member of Congress. So each dot is connected to every other dot based on whether or not they ever agreed when they were voting for a bill. Okay, so if two people, if two Congress people ever voted the same way, whether for or against on any bill, that made it so that they had a line in between them. OK, that's it. That's all there is to it. Hundreds of people, uh, color blue dots and red dots and a couple of non-color dots with lines connecting them every time they agree. So you can kind of see what's happening here in 1951, right? So there's kind of like the blue dots on one side, the red dots on that side. But there's lots and lots of lines connecting them because Congress people were actually agreeing with each other when they were voting for or against particular bills I'll summarized over this entire year. This is 1951. Here is what happened in 1993, right? So <laughs> as we'll talk about in a future video, this is a case in which the data visualization makes the message super duper obvious. I don't think it is necessary for me to say much about the difference between 1951 and 1993 here. Uh, it's really obvious the fact that, that the segregation between the blue dots and the red dots is a lot more stark. And if you look between them, it is really difficult to see any lines connecting any of the blue dots and the red dots. This visualization was repeated over many years. And so you can see that the difference um, in this, uh, the segregation between the blue dots and the red dots did not happen overnight, did not happen uh, in one, any one year, but in fact emerged over many, many decades um, and has gotten to the point in which in 2011, which is the last infographic down there, there was almost an entirely separable set of clusters of the red dots and the blue dots as well. Okay, so in this video, we talked all about the data types. And in particular, I introduced the three fundamental types of data, numerical data, ordinal data, and categorical data. And we talked about why it's really important to, to know which data type you're dealing with, because it determines how you analyze and visualize it. This is uh, an important point, because these data types are usually what all of the mathematical tools are being built for. And so if you don't have one of these data types straightforwardly, one of the first things you do, like if you have an image, you have an audio file, you have something else that's not naturally one of these, first thing you would do is think about which of these data types you can turn your data into. right? And so if you can do that, then you can leverage a bunch of different tools that other people have built um, and do things with your data without having to invent everything from scratch. So that's really important to pay attention to what type of data you've got.